somehow this morning take the auditorium and put it into two pieces and have those I think that you would be amazed by those that would be in the blessed ye come but also we'd be horrified by all those that have passed through this church that would be in that group depart from me ye cursed it is a, it is a profound statement that he makes in, in getting us to understand what the heavens are going to be like and what eternity is going to be like and what is going to happen 
at that point where we are judged either as being in the family of God or out of the family of God. There is no middle road. It is white and black. It is straight and narrow, and it is broad that leadeth to destruction. He speaks here about a shepherd's analogy of separating the sheep from the goats. The sheep are on the right hand. The goats are on the left. And when we gain this knowledge, when we begin to understand the truth, it weighs heavy on our soul because there's the reality of eternity stands here. You see, heaven is not only going to be, heaven is. You depart from this body. Philippians tells us to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Heaven is. But there's also the reality of this. Hell is. There is a place of eternal damnation for those that depart out of the family of God. They are amongst the cursed. I know that in our culture today, everybody says, well, you can't know those things. Jesus said, this is the way it's going to be. Here's the truth. And there's no gray where it's debatable. Well, I'm going to be... See how it comes out. Nope. Jesus says either you'll hear blessed or you'll hear cursed. Weigh it out. Understand it. Know that God says you'll either be on one or the other. And only in this lifetime do you have an opportunity to change that. Only while you have breath in your body can you move from either the blessed or the cursed? And God allows us to get a glimpse of this. Let me read some verses from you out of uh, Matthew 25. For the sake of time, I'm just going to hit the highlights here. You take time to read it over as he's preaching this and giving this as God talks and allows us this insight. Let me begin in verse 31, Matthew 25. It says, And when the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, all people. And he shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then shall the king say unto them, of his right hand. Come, ye blessed of my Father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now, go down with me to verse 41. And I'll kind of pick these up and fill these in. Then shall he say also unto them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now watch the conclusion of chapter 25 down in verse 26. And these shall go away into the everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. Here God says, there is a difference. And know that you will spend eternity in either heaven or hell. Now this morning, I want us to take a look at this place called hell. I know that many are saying today it's not politically correct. I know many Christians will tell you, you can't judge this. But listen, the Bible tells you, you better judge where you stand before God before you leave this earth. <laughs> listen to his conclusion in verse 41 as he speaks about these that will have to depart out of the presence of God for all of eternity. And then shall he say unto them that's on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now, verse 41 
has a lot of spiritual context in it that really clarifies unto us the understanding of the judgment and the wrath of God upon sin. He, he first tells us that in this group where all humanities gather together and the division comes and God either puts you on the right or the left hand and on the left side these are going to be departed they're going to leave the presence of God and they're going to be cursed and then he uses a term into the everlasting fire you see it there and understand that God warns us there is a judgment that is coming this is not a pleasant picture this is not where we come and understand exactly what God says to us in these human bodies to be able to comprehend what that looks like. We have a glimpse of it. And he gives us that glimpse in the word fire. But he also magnifies that because he says everlasting fire. Now I don't know your understanding of fire. I know mine. It hurts. I've been burnt by welders. I grabbed steel when that was real dumb. <laughs> I have got too close and had no eyebrows for a few weeks. A little gas on it. Don't do that! Don't do that. <laughs> I've seen people in burn units and it's an ugly sight. I don't know in my mind anything more painful in this life than fire. I'm grateful that I've been given mercy and that I've always been get God delivered me from my stupidity. It didn't go as far as it could have went. And others went a little farther. But when God speaks here, He speaks to us about understanding. You do not want to be in that group because they're headed for an everlasting fire. And then He gives us an understanding of what that fire is and 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 gets our heart and our mind moved over to understand what it means. This, this destruction, this pain, this agony that comes because of this fire. Understanding what he's talking about here. Allowing the human mind to come to a reality of what he talks about. It is a continuing, everlasting separation <coughs> and fire. Isaiah the prophet speaks well of this and understanding that we have to see this torment, see exactly what God is speaking of here in Matthew chapter number 25 and verse 41. He gives us that this fire was, to, was created by God, not for human beings. But did you catch it? For the devil and his angels. You know what that means to us? As Isaiah is going to put it here in Isaiah chapter number 30 here in just a moment. It means that this is a spiritual fire. The devil was created an angel of light. The devil was created to be in the presence of God in a ministering spirit. Hell was created for the devil and his angels. So beyond the body, beyond whatever you can conjure up in your mind of how severe you think fire is, this fire of hell reaches your spirit. Your eternal being. Because it was created for the devil and his angels. So what does that mean to us? Well, in Isaiah chapter number 30 here, 
Isaiah speaks of this fire, and he allows us to see back in the Israelite history and their understanding of what God was trying to get us to see out of Matthew 25. Depart from me, ye cursed, into the everlasting fire. No one wants to leave this earth without Jesus Christ. Because there's a judgment coming. Listen to Isaiah as the Spirit of God moves him. In verse 33, as he closes out the chapter there, it says, For Tobit is ordained of old, yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. And the breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. Now here we're given some more truth, some more clarity to what God is trying to get us to see and understand. If you do your history research, if you walk through the scriptures and you walk through true history, not history that's been revised. Now, folks, and especially you young people, understand this. In our culture we're living in, a lot of people are trying to rewrite history. They're trying to change it in school. Not everything you hear in school is true. Listen to me. Not everything you hear on television is fact. I don't care if it says it's the Discovery Channel or the History Channel or, or uh, some. Well, I'm a professor. Or I'm a doctor. Or I got this, this credential. Listen, human credentials do not make you honest. There are a lot of people trying to deceive people today. God gives you truth. And you need to understand truth. And there's only one truth. There's only one being that has been to eternity, come from eternity, and went back to eternity. I can stand here all day and say, well, I think God's been there, done that. He created in the past. He is in the presence. He is living the day. And God will be in the future. When all else has passed away, heaven and earth is gone. The throne of God will still be there. The throne of God will create a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem. Now, I wish I had time to preach all that to you today, but you won't endure all that. Let me just tell you, it's out there. And you need to know that truth. But you need to also understand that in that truth, God also is warning you there is a place of destruction. There is an everlasting fire. Now if you go here to Isaiah chapter number 33 or 30 and verse 33, excuse me. Chapter 30 and verse 33 you'll find this. He says Tophet. Now Tophet is an idol. It's a Canaanite idol that came out of idol worship of Moloch. It was when the Canaanites were in the land and they were uh, oppressing Israel and they had come up against them and they took the valley of Jehinnah and they made that into their idol sacrifice place. And then part of their false worship, their idolatry worship, was they, they set up this statue, they set up this uh, form of what they believed was a god. And it was this god of Molech. And they believed that if they created a fire around this god, they could then take their children and offer this child to this god. And by the beating of these drums, and by the fire that was consuming these little innocent infants, they would then please this god and this God would bring them prosperity and, and grain and agricultural increase. And they were then ruling the world. 
in the Scriptures, King Josiah comes along, gathers the people of Israel, and under the power of God, defeats the Canaanites. And when they defeat the Canaanites, they stop this idolatry worship, and Judah takes over, and they turn this valley of Gehenna into a garbage dump because of all the sin and all the degradation and all the fires that have been created in there. They dumped all the garbage out of Jerusalem into that valley, and then they set it on fire and it burned, and it reminded them of the evil that had been done in this valley. It brought forth that which, which Isaiah was saying in that tophet, in that idolatry worship, you have to understand that God says there is this evil, this consumption that is destroying the people. It was the oppression of the Canaanites that allowed them to get a glimpse of the evil that awaited those that walked away from God and were not in the family of God and they were destroyed in this awful, awful, ugly place called Gehenna in the idolatry worship. You could go over to Luke chapter number 16 of the New Testament and there again you'll see this man, this one that was a rich man here upon this earth and he died and he lifted up his eyes and he was in this place called hell. This place of torment. His suffering was upon him. And in this place, he was in torment of flames. You'll find it down there in verse 24 of Luke 16. And as you read that discourse, you begin to get an understanding of what awaits those that go into this valley, that goes into this place of everlasting fire. You begin to see what God wants you to understand to keep you from going that direction, but rather to understand that there is another choice that you need to make. In Luke 16, this rich man, as he's there in torment, and he realizes there's nothing he can do to change his status. In fact, he pleads for mercy from God that, he, that this uh, Lazarus, the, the beggar, would come and dip his finger in water and touch his tongue for he was in torment and he was explained that those things could not happen. And his greatest cry in this place was that his brothers would not come to this place. His family would not come to this place. That Moses and Elijah and others would go back and testify of how that this place was a reality and he could not get that done. The testimonies were there. God said they have the information. You know, when, when you get to this place called hell, I think your question would probably, humanly speaking and human reasoning would be, how long? How long am I going to have to stay here? Am I here for a day, a month, a week, a century, a lifetime? A hundred years? No. You're there for everlasting. Luke 16 shows us there is no way to change that. It is an eternal damnation. Dear ones, you have to understand, God has warned us over and over again. There's only two ways to go here. When you stand before God upon the authority of Scripture, if you do not have Christ as your Savior, you'll be cast out. You'll be told, depart from me, ye cursed. Now I understand, in your mind, you can be standing there today and saying, preacher, you're trying to scare me. Nope. Well, you're just ranting and raving. You don't know what you're talking about. You better pick up this book. There's nothing that I have said this morning that you can't find in this book. The everlasting God has warned you there's a place called Tugbat. There's a place called Hades. There's a place called Hell. There's a place of everlasting fire. There's a place of brimstone where the breath of God feeds it throughout all of eternity. And you better not go there. 
You say, well, preacher, how do you miss that? Back to Matthew 25. There is a group. There is that second group. And he speaks there of that one that had come before Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the final judge of all mankind. And he says, come ye blessed. Amen. Those that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, not on their own righteousness, but on the righteousness of God, they will come before the righteous judge and Jesus Christ will welcome you in and bring you into heaven above to see the glory of God, to know all that God has given you. Jesus Christ is the one that will welcome you into this place called heaven. Over in Revelation chapter number 1 and verse number 18, there it says this, I am he that liveth and was dead. Oh, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Revelation chapter number 1 and 18 is where Christ is telling us that He is the one that will welcome you into eternity. He is the one that holds the keys to hell. The devil cannot take you to hell. But Jesus Christ can keep you out of hell. That place that is so dreaded and so evil and so destructive and so tormenting can be delivered because Jesus Christ is the one that can forgive you of your sin. Jesus Christ is the one that can welcome you into the Father's house. You see, the result of disbelief, unbelief in Christ is to be cast into this eternal hell. Depart from me, ye cursed. But on the other side, on the right side, on the white side, on the side of the sheep, there is a shepherd that left heaven in all of its glory, came down to this earth, died upon a cross, rose again the third day, and ascended up to be with the Father because He loved you enough to make a place for you. Amen. Amen. You can go to John 14 and you'll find there where Jesus Christ says that I've gone to prepare a place for you and I will come again and receive you unto Myself. As dreaded as hell is, folks, there is the glory of heaven that outshines all the torment of hell. There is a place where Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, waits for those that will receive Him, that will come into His Father's house, that will be blessed by Him, enter into that eternal place, that eternal rest. That is only found in Jesus Christ. You'll study there in Matthew 25 and you'll see that it is your relationship with God that brings you into that place called heaven. Amen. Brother Matthew Castle was preaching the other morning and he mentioned there in Matthew 7 about that terrible place where God stands before all those that are there and they're saying, well, we've done this and we've done that and, and we've prophesied and we've preached and we've healed and we've done all those wonderful things. But Jesus said unto them in Matthew 7, verse 21 there, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. Why? For I never knew thee. Go back and listen to that. Understand. It's not about your desire. It's not about your good works. It's not about the things that you think you know. It's about your relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, the one sitting on the throne, the one that will say, Come ye blessed, is Jesus Christ. None others. 
Your grandma and your grandpa can't get you into heaven. Your mom and your dad can't get you into heaven. And they can't cast you out either. It's not up to them. Folks, it's not even up to the preacher. Now you, you can be kind to me and I thank you for that. And you can come and listen. And you can sit here and say, I understand that. I even believe that. I know there is a God. But friend, does God know your name? Has Jesus Christ written down your name in the Lamb's book of life? The only way you'll ever meet that which Christ says will be the final judgment where He departs those that stand before Him. All nations, all humanity is when Christ places you over on the right side and says, Come ye blessed. For all that's over there in the evil, my friend, God has placed all the righteous over here. God has provided you a way. Have you trusted and believed? Put your confidence. Are you walking in the way today? Because you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You don't want to miss this. You don't want to just go, oh, that's old and out of style and, and antiquated. It, it really doesn't apply to me. My friend, it applies to you right today. It's as important today as the day that Isaiah wrote it, Matthew wrote it, John the Revelator wrote it. God moved to get you to understand this day is coming. And it won't be long, friend. Your loved ones are going to have to stand before Jesus Christ. Your grandbabies are going to have to stand before Jesus Christ. in two groups. There's only two. Where will you stand? What will Jesus say to you on that day? Stand in this place. <coughs> Dear Father, Lord God, I pray for every soul that stands in this auditorium this morning. As terrible and dreaded and frightening are those hellfires that are everlasting tormentation that will destroy not only the body and the soul, but will torment throughout all of eternity. There are those that will stand in the blessed. There are those that will come before the presence of God and be welcomed home. I pray for every soul that they truly know that you are their Savior, that you died for their sins, and they can come to you for grace and mercy, peace and joy. And have confidence and contentment that they'll stand in the number of the blessed. They've applied the blood to their sins. They know Christ as their Savior. I pray now, not a one will depart out of your presence. But all will come as the blessed of the Father. Lord, help us to deal with you now as you speak to our soul. In Jesus' name.
I pray you know the reality of that song. That you're truly trusting in God and all that He's done for you. Over in Psalms 95 and 6, there's this verse that's up there on the screen. It's a quote for you. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. I pray today that you'll worship God. You'll worship Him for that He's delivered you out of that cursed place called hell. Out of that everlasting fire into His presence. If you have salvation in Jesus Christ, may you praise His name today. May you give Him thanks for all that He's given to you. May you honor Him for you with a life that is pleasing unto the Lord. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. May that be your prayer today. Good to have you in the house of God. Appreciate you coming, listening. I pray you'll study those passages that we discussed this morning. Let the Word of God sink into your life and your heart. May you know the presence of God. May you be in the presence of God when you depart out of this life.